Hi, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry, from engineering to operations to emergency response. I don't claim to know everything there is to know nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. If you like this video, please give me a like down below, and go ahead and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this coming. If you didn't like this video, please let me know what I can do better down in the comments. I'm always looking to improve. Today we're going to be looking at another Kurz Gazat video called WE WILL FIX CLIMATE CHANGE. WILL is in all caps, so this should be good. Our home is burning. Rapid climate change is destabilizing our world. It seems our emissions will not fall quickly enough to avoid runaway warming, and we may soon hit tipping points that will lead to the collapse of ecosystems and our civilization. While scientists, activists, and much of the younger generation Those poor birds. <laughs> urge action, it appears most politicians are not committed to doing anything meaningful, while the fossil fuel industry still works actively against change. It seems humanity can't overcome its greed and obsession with short-term profit and personal gain to save itself. And so for many, the future looks grim and hopeless. Young people feel particularly anxious and depressed. <laughs> Instead of looking ahead to a lifetime of opportunity, they wonder if they will even have a future or if they should bring kids into this world. It's an age of doom and hopelessness, and giving up seems the only sensible thing to do. But... I think they're going to turn this video around a little bit. <laughs> Sounding pretty doom and gloom. <laughs> That's not true. You are not doomed. Humanity is there not doomed. Despite the seriousness of the situation, for years, positive trends have accumulated and there is finally some good news and a clear path towards our collective climate goals. Welcome to our TED Talk. Please watch this video to the end. Check out our detailed sources afterwards to learn more. Okay, let's start with the scariest things. Cancelling the apocalypse. Some of the most widely shared stories about climate change are that it is an existential threat, the end of human civilization, and maybe even our own extinction event, and that it's basically unavoidable now. But what does science actually say? As of 2022, the global average temperature has risen 1.2 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial times. Limiting warming to 1.5 degrees was the most ambitious goal of the Paris Agreement, but we are not likely to meet it. Already with the warming we have today, hot places will get hotter, wet places wetter, and the risk and strength of extreme weather events increase significantly. Warming beyond 2 degrees makes all of these extremes more extreme. Extreme weather events more common, with more ecosystems under major pressure. Some will not survive. At 3 degrees, significant parts of Earth, especially in developing countries, might become unable to feed their populations. Heat waves will become a major global issue. Large-scale natural systems will break down. The scale and frequency of hurricanes, fires and droughts will further increase and cause trillions in damage. Poor regions and subsistence farmers will be hit the hardest. Hundreds of millions of people will need to leave their homes. In the 4 to 8 degree range, the apocalypse begins. The hothouse earth, where things change so quickly that it may become unable to support our large human population and billions may perish, leaving the rest on a hostile alien planet. A decade ago, for lack of action and perspective, many scientists assumed a 4 plus degree world was our future, and a lot of public communication focused on exactly this future path. Luckily, it's much less likely that this version of the apocalypse will come to pass. It's good to know. If current climate policies stagnate, we're likely to end up with warming of around 3 degrees Celsius by 2100 which is scary and tragic and far from acceptable. But this is actually good news. How? In the last decade, we've seen enough progress that most scientists now think that we have likely avoided apocalyptic climate change. Although substantial risk... That's good to know. ...still remains, we can pretty confidently say that humanity isn't going anywhere. Civilization might have to change, but it will endure. Which begs the question, what has changed over the last 10 years, and is this really good news? 
The Invisible Shift. You probably know this story. The last decade has been an immense failure for climate policies around the world. Instead of passing comprehensive binding bills that would meaningfully reduce emissions, we mostly did nothing. A lost decade with one negative record after another. And this story is true, and it's one reason why so many people are giving up. But it is not the whole picture. Despite the lack of climate policies and ongoing lobbying and misinformation campaigns from the fossil fuel industries, there was a lot of progress. Let's go back 20 years to see why today is so different. Between 2000 and 2010, greenhouse gas emissions had grown by 24%, three times as much as the increase in the previous decade. Subsidies for fossil fuels aimed at promoting economic growth caused a colossal increase in their consumption. For developing countries like China and India, coal was the cheapest fuel for growth, while rich countries showed little interest in changing their ways. In 2010, many people expected these trends to continue. Instead of decreased... I like that they're showing all these old references from what people thought 10 years ago versus what people thought now, if you look in the lower right-hand corner of these videos. That's cool. ...fossil fuel use, its consumption would rise. The next decade turned out to be very different, though. First of all, coal burning in developing countries like India has slowed down or leveled off, like in China, and it's plummeted in rich countries like the UK and US. Since 2015, three quarters of planned coal plants have been cancelled and 44 countries have committed to stop building them. Yeah. 2021 sources, okay. Years ago, that would have seemed like wishful thinking, but today we can say with confidence, coal is dying. It's just not competitive anymore. Because technologies we thought would remain expensive matured rapidly instead. Just now about the war in Ukraine. Uh, yes, coal is definitely uh, is definitely going down. Um, main fossil fuel that's gaining ground is uh, is natural gas, but it doesn't produce nearly as much carbon as uh, coal. Renewable electricity has shown explosive progress. In a mere decade, wind energy got three times cheaper. Solar electricity is now 10 times cheaper. Cheaper than coal or any other fossil fuel burning power plant, despite the massive subsidies and global infrastructure propping up fossil fuels. 25 times more solar and nearly five times more wind electricity is produced today compared with 10 years ago, which is of course not nearly enough. One of the biggest obstacles is the variability of their power output. Renewables need a lot of energy storage to be a reliable power source, like expensive batteries. Amazingly, battery prices have decreased by 97% in the past. Yes, the uh, storage pr um, problem is one thing for renewables. While the cost has gone down, and that's amazing, um, they need to be stored, and they also need to be more weather resistant. Um, in 2021, uh, there was a major freeze in Texas, and Texas has a massive amount of uh, wind energy, but those wind turbines are more susceptible to uh, damage by uh, severe winter weather. And granted, this being Texas, severe weather, winter weather doesn't happen nearly as often as it does in other parts of the world. But uh, the Public Utility Commission of Texas and several um, producers, generators, including the, uh, the nuclear plant that I used to work at in Texas, has all spent tremendous amount of resources to um, prevent these sort of uh, weather-related problems from um, happening again, like putting heat tracing in pipes, winterizing um, the, uh, the blades, the structure of, uh, of, of wind turbines. So... We are learning with these. Renewables is enough, I don't think it's gonna do it, but it's certainly a step in the right direction. 30 years, 60% in the last decade alone, which will serve all kinds of green technology like electric cars. You might say, well, that's great, but didn't Kurzgesagt's last climate video say that while wind and solar are nice, we need nothing less than a fundamental transition of our global industrial system? Yes, but luckily the shift goes beyond just the energy sector. Throughout nice, they're showing a nuclear plant too. <laughs> economy, people are working on improving current technology to lower emissions. We're rapidly replacing old incandescent light bulbs with LEDs that are 10 times more efficient. 
In 2020, about 7 out of 10 new cars in Norway were electric or hybrid. In 2021, it was already 8 out of 10. And the list goes on, from electric heating and better insulation, to ships traveling at half speed to save fuel. Wherever you look... I didn't know about the ships thing, that's good to know. ...and scientists, engineers and entrepreneurs trying to solve some aspect of climate change. Enormous amounts of human ingenuity are being brought to bear on this problem, with more and more people deciding... One thing I also heard about is slower air travel, like going back to using blimps or zeppelins or something like that. I wonder if that's going to take off. Pun intended. <laughs> Prioritize preventing rapid climate change. Solutions for low carbon production of cement, electronics and steel, and innovations like artificial meat and carbon capture are in the works. The more of these technologies we... Artificial meat, huh? You mean like actual meat, not the Beyond Burger stuff? Hmm. Ploy, the cheaper new and better technology gets. The cheaper they get, the more people use them. And so on. We can see the impact already. The domestic CO2 output of rich countries is falling without a major recession. Since the year 2000, the EU as a whole shows a 21% decrease, Italy 28%, the UK 35%, Denmark 43%. But the best news may be that emissions are no longer necessarily coupled with economic growth. In the past, this was an inconvenient truth. To get richer, you had to emit more, which led to fierce arguments between developing and developed countries about the fairness of reducing emissions while their populations were still poor. But in the last decade, we've seen that it is possible to increase prosperity without increasing emissions. Emissions in the Czech Republic dropped 13%, while their GDP grew by 27%. France reduced their CO2 emissions by 14%, while increasing GDP by 15%. Romania saw an 8% decrease. That is highly encouraging. And 35% growth. And even the largest economy on Earth, the USA, decreased emissions by 4% while growing their GDP by 26%. Some of you may call this a numbers trick. That rich countries are just exporting emissions to poorer nations by moving the dirty parts of their economies like manufacturing. But even when we account for all of our imported goods, the numbers still look positive. It's no longer a matter of having to choose between prosperity and the climate, as it seemed to be a decade ago. Developing countries will profit from that because as rich countries pay for the expensive development of green technologies, they can adopt them more cheaply. They can skip most of the high emission phase that today's rich countries went through. We are at the point where not de- That's a cool idea. Um, just skipping that, that phase out. Like that whole period during the Industrial Revolution in the 1800s where we all went straight to coal and heavy, dirty industry, just skipping that. Makes you wonder what it would be like if we like went back in time and ran everything on nuclear and renewables or something. <laughs> so we just skipped that whole, that whole dirty phase. Anyway. Organizing is a bad business decision. And we haven't even really talked about solutions like carbon capture. In 2000, it didn't really exist. In 2022, that technology does exist and costs around $600 to remove one ton of CO2 from the atmosphere. As investment pours in and the technology matures and begins to scale, it's likely that these costs will plummet over the next few decades. So everything's fine then. Well, let's not get carried away. All of these processes are great, but not nearly fast enough. We're still doing way too little and technology will not magically solve everything. We need to use fewer resources and use them longer, design consumer goods that are repairable and durable, and decrease our energy requirements. We need much better infrastructure, agriculture, and cities. It will still be hard work, especially to get the right policies passed and enacted. But for the first time ever, there are a few trend lines pointing solidly in the right direction. And now imagine if all of this was achieved without proper financial and political support, and despite fossil fuel lobbying, just think what humanity can do when climate change finally get- Talk a lot about fossil fuel lobbying. A lot of fossil fuel uh, companies are, have seen you know, the light, if you will, and are shifting a lot of their assets towards um, renewable generation and actually lowering their, their production in, say, barrels of oil. But be that as it may.
the political attention and funding it needs. So is it okay to feel hopeful again? The situation is still dire and serious, so what's the point of focusing on this side of the story? The Trap of Hopelessness. Yeah, never a spot anyone wants to be in. There's, look, as long as you're, my view, as long as you're still breathing, there's something you can do. Climate change can feel overwhelming and make your future seem bleak. The sadness and hopelessness that many people feel is real and very destructive because it causes apathy. Apathy that is only serving the fossil fuel industry that is still delaying change however it can. In a sense, they have weaponized hopelessness. We are now in phase four in the public debate about rapid climate change action. Phase one was, climate change is not real. Phase two was, climate change is real, but not caused by humans. Phase three was, climate change may be caused by humans, but it's not that bad. Phase four is, climate change is no longer avoidable. We are... Looks like they skipped a step there. <laughs> the whole climate change is caused by humans, but we can fix it. <laughs> Let's go for phase three and a half. And, and it doesn't matter what we do. <laughs> if we want the world to change, we first need to believe that change is possible. And we have an abundance of evidence that it is. Changes to our industrial system are gaining momentum. Technology gets better and cheaper. Climate change has become a key issue in most free elections. As more and more younger people move into influential positions, they prioritize climate change and work on new solutions. In 2022, most governments not only acknowledge it, but set their own net zero goals in democratic and autocratic countries. The results of years of fighting a steep uphill battle are now clearly visible. I like King Penguin. The pressure needs to keep increasing to make sure that the promises made today are actually kept. Climate doomerism is the equivalent of giving up, even though you can still prevent not just the worst case, but also mitigate most of the bad things, make changes in time to adapt better, and prevent the poorest from suffering. That is why hopelessness and apathy are so dangerous. If the last in many ways wasted decade has shown anything, then it's that progress is being made and that dire scenarios are just predictions, not our sealed fate. As of 2022, based on current global policies, we will end up in a three degrees world. Now it's our job to yet again prove the predictions wrong, despite how serious and urgent things are, to turn that three degrees into a two degrees and then see where we can go from there. For that, we need hope. And we hope we gave you that today, at least a little that you feel that things are serious, but also that you have a future, that you can have kids without dooming them or the world, mm. that taking action today is worth it, and that despite powerful industries doing everything to delay it, society is changing. If you need a more concrete roadmap of what you can do personally, we're working on a follow-up video to talk about that in greater detail. Doomerism, inactivity, and weaponized hopelessness are the only trump cards left for the powers that don't want change. Don't let them win. We're still excited about the future. And we think one of the best things you can do to keep your optimism and curiosity... Okay, there's the, there's the sponsor, I thought so. That's a nice message at the end. Um, don't give in to the... Uh, the doomerism, the apathy. I want... I take the term Trump card was a slide at Donald Trump. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I know that they talked a good bit about the fossil fuel com companies and um, certain politicians, but it's, yeah, it even don't don't wait on politicians before trying to do something to make any change. That's that's kind of one moral lesson here. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that was a good video. It was actually n nice and nice and uplifting uh, towards the end. Please let me know what you think about climate change uh, down in the comments. I, for one, think we're on the right path. I'm heavily biased towards investing in more advanced uh, nuclear technology, though I'm also supportive of renewables as well, and really whatever whatever we can to uh, make our processes more efficient that we can take more care of our planet and then go on to other planets.
Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.